Hi, I'm Illinois State Treasurer Michael Ferrix, and thank you for joining me today for the first Finwell Fireside Livestream this spring. The Illinois Financial Wellness Hub, or Finwell Hub as we like to say, provides free resources to help all Illinois residents plan a better financial future. We've dropped a link for the Finwell Hub in the chat and encourage you to sign up for an account. We'll reference helpful tools on the platform throughout the program today. But before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Throughout the webinar, we'll share helpful links in the chat. We will answer audience questions towards the end of the program. You can submit questions using the Q&A section. Click on the three dots in the right-hand corner of the screen and select Q&A. While we'll answer questions at the end, you are encouraged to submit questions at any time during the program. Closed captioning is available in English. Click on the CC icon in the left-hand corner of your screen to turn on closed captioning. This is being recorded and will be available in the webinar section of the Finwell Hub. Now, we're ready to get started. Today, we'll discuss how to set personal financial goals and we'll share practical budgeting tips to help you reach those goals. I'm joined by our special guest, Dr. Harold Pollack. Dr. Pollack is the Helen Ross Professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice at the University of Chicago. He's an affiliate professor in the Biological Sciences Collegiate Division in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Dr. Pollack co-directs the University of Chicago Urban Health Lab. Dr. Pollack's research regularly appears in Health Services Research, American Journal of Public Health, Journal of the American Medical Association, and other publications. His popular journalism has appeared in the Washington Post, New York Times, Vox, Atlantic Monthly, and other publications. He regularly advises local, state, and federal policymakers on public health, addiction, and crime policy. Most pertinent for today's presentation, he is an expert on personal finance and co-author with Helene Olin of the best-selling book, The Index Card, Why Personal Finance Doesn't Have to Be Complicated. Harold, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I wish my mom were here to hear that uh, introduction. That was, uh, she, uh, she would, I'm sure she would fill in a few things for you. I'm sure your mother is probably on our live stream right now, or, <laughs> or you can connect her to watch it later. But it's thank you so much for having me and for the work that the Finwell Hub is doing, and I think it's just really important. Great. Well, thanks very much for being here. So can you tell us a little bit about what the index card is and mm -hmm. how it came to be? So it's funny, I, I must say, I never really thought about personal finance at all until I was maybe 40 years old. And, uh, and in fact, remember I moved to Chicago. At, I, was, I was teaching at the University of Michigan and the University of Chicago offered me a job and the university offered me some money to help me buy my house for the down payment. And I remember I went to this banker and I had, had all these ambitious plans you know, for what kind of Taj Mahal mansion I was gonna buy. I, I had just gotten tenure so I was in this sort of don't you know who I am phase of life that academics go through. And at some point I took a breath and this banker said, Dr. Polk, I have to tell you, you're not a good customer. You're 40 years old. You haven't saved any money. You, the only money you have is what the university is giving you, and like you have to just really ratchet down, you know, how, how expensive your house is. And then we moved into um, uh, Chicago, uh -huh. and um, and then my mother-in-law died suddenly, and my uh, my brother-in-law, who's disabled, had to move into our home. We had this big financial crisis, and I really, I suddenly realized I had to learn about this. And so I started studying up on it. And when I was studying up on it, I realized that if you watch financial TV, it seems really complicated. People are like, what kind of stocks to buy, whatever. The real experts, it was actually much simpler. And, and I did a little video interview with a financial author named Helene Olin. And I said, the problem that the personal financial advice industry has is that the best advice is available for free at the library and basically fits on an index card. And I started getting all these people emailing and calling me saying, well, where's the index card? And, and of course, I was just woofing. Uh, so, but I took out one of my daughter's four by six index cards. She was in seventh grade at the time. And I just scribbled maybe 90 seconds. I just scribbled nine rules. And I took a picture with my iPhone. And I posted it on the web. And I got 400,000 hits. And I remember I won this little index card thing, won Money Magazine's Best New Idea of the Year Award. And so What year was that? That was uh, 2014. 2014. And I remember the real financial experts at the University of Chicago 
uh, like at our business school said, oh, what did you do? Like I heard you won this award and I showed them the card and they were like, like you're kidding. Like I've been doing this stuff for 30 years. I'm like a genuine expert at, and you like don't, everything you wrote is completely obvious. And it was all stuff like pay off your credit card and so on. And, and, and like you won an award for that? Like, and I said, that's kind of the point is that it's obvious, but that we all need to kind of know that and, and, and follow it. And so, so, and then out of that, Helene and I then wrote the index card book, and so that's the that's the origin of it. Good. Well, it sounds like big change to your family brought finances to the forefront in a new way. Can you tell us how and where you started this? You give us a, a little bit of an idea mm -hmm. uh, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but how did you come to work with Helene? Well, so, you know, she really is an expert on finance. She came to it with with a lot more expertise than I had, and. Uh, but I became so motivated because when my brother-in-law moved into our house, I remember at one point he was 340 pounds, and so we had to buy new furniture. And I remember at one point I bought a Lazy Boy chair, and it was like you know, $900 or something that he could just fit in. And I remember thinking, like, I'm gonna hemorrhage my money. And, and I suddenly realized, how do I, how do I realistically save? How do I get on a budget? What do I have to do to execute? And you know, I, you know, I was a, PhD, academic, whatever, in principle, I had all these skills, but I'd never really focused on it. And, and, and people like Helene uh, just were really valuable and stuff. Like, this is how you get on a budget. This is the 50, 30, 20 thing. This is, uh, uh, you know, this is what you do so that you can live sensibly in a realistic way, you know, given whatever your economic circumstances is. And, and that was just so valuable and so grateful to Helene and others for helping me through that period. And, uh, and I hope that, that, that we can help other people today. Yeah. Well, we hope so too. It sounds really simple, but for a lot of people, they find it difficult. But that brings us to our first step, identifying priorities and setting goals. So there are so many things vying for our attention and money. It's helpful to sit down and think about what is most important to us and our families. When you do this, you'll probably have multiple priorities that need attention in the short term and the long term. So start thinking about these priorities and visualizing what you want to see in the future. Maybe you see yourself retiring and feeling financially secure or paying for your child's education. Or maybe your top priority is more short term, like paying off credit card debt or starting an emergency savings fund. Now that you've visualized a few priorities, it's time to start crafting them into goals. When writing goals, it's important to make sure they are SMART goals. SMART goals are, as an acronym, specific, measurable, achievable or attainable, relevant or realistic, and time-based or time-measured. Setting goals that are achievable is one of the most important things you can do. Much like a strict diet eventually fails, an overly ambitious goal with strict limitations can become discouraging. It's good to start small and build your momentum with little successes along the way. So this wisdom also applies to setting the right timeline for your goal. A good time frame can set you up for success by holding you accountable and keeping you motivated as the day gets closer. Let's look at an example of a SMART goal. I will pay off my $5,000 in credit card debt in the next three years. The goal is specific and measurable. The $5,000 in credit card debt and relevant and time-based in the next years. For this example, the credit card pay-down tool can be used to determine if the goal is personally achievable. You can plug in your information and see how long it will take to pay off your debt based on how much you can put towards your monthly payments. Check the chat for a link. Now that you've identified your top priorities, and written SMART financial goals, what's next? It's time to think about what goals you need to take to reach these, what steps you need to take to reach these goals. What resources do you need to achieve your goals? Maybe you need to research your goal in more depth to determine how much it will actually cost. Other resources could be learning more through courses or tools on the Finwell Hub. You could seek guidance from a professional financial advisor, job training, or an advanced degree for a promotion with higher pay. So what other milestones might you need to achieve before reaching your big goal? For example, if your goal is to buy a home, 
There could be multiple steps to take before you're ready, like saving for a down payment, improving your credit score, reducing your current debt load, or others. These milestones can be an important way to track your progress and motivate you to keep striving for your larger goal. I mentioned that we all have multiple priorities vying for our attention and money. So Harold, how do you find balance between these priorities and make strategic trade-offs? I think that's a great question. I, and I think you have to be self-aware about your vulnerabilities and you have to think about what gives you mojo so that, so that you can achieve the goals that you're going after. So I'll give you one example. Uh, after our index card book came out, a lot of people would come to me and they would ask for financial advice. And one of the things that we would often talk about is what, how, can you, how can you set up to save in a way that really gives you some momentum? So I'm a, one of my uh, colleagues is, a, is a, a single mom, she doesn't make a ton of money, and we were talking about how can, I, how can I save my money? And so one of the scenarios we talked about is she's walking with her daughter on the Magnificent Mile in Chicago, and she sees in the, in the window of a fancy store um, a really nice sweater that's $140. And she says to her daughter, you know, this sweater would be perfect for me. It's got my skin, it goes with my skin tone. I would just rock this. But you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to buy that sweater. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that $140 and put it into your college account. And someday you're going to do the same thing for your daughter. And she's taken this moment of having to deny herself this really nice sweater that she would rock to an awesome parenting moment. And because she knows there's a trade-off there. Yeah. And and I think each of us has to, has to think about, you know, what motivates us. And, and, you know, and I'm sure some of this will come up in the conversation, the envelope method. There's a whole variety of things that we do where you sort of say, how can I, cre I've got this long-term goal, how can I give myself some sort of short-term reward or, or momentum so that I can work towards that long-term goal? And, you know, paying down my credit card debt, things like that. And so each of us does it differently. But I think it's really important to s take some time and to say, you know, what is really important to me that will help me achieve my goal? Yeah, I think it was a nice motivation for her, mm -hmm. but also for her child as well. Saying, I'd go in there, I, I tell mm -hmm. my daughter when she wants something, I said, well, I can, I can spend money on that, or I can put that money into your college savings fund. And the majority of the time, my daughter decides for delayed gratification. And I think we can teach good lessons going forward. Absolutely. You can build habits, but once you're an adult, how do you find the motivation to stick with your savings goals? Uh, and what do you do when you stumble? Because we all stumble every now and then, whether it be our savings goals or with a diet. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's really important to understand that, as you mentioned in the beginning, that you know, starvation diet it doesn't work. Yeah. And so you have to be self-aware and say, uh, you know, what's realistic for me? And how do I and 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 how do I understand my vulnerability? So when I stumble, I want to have some self-compassion to say, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not perfect, but there's a reason why I stumbled, and how can I avoid that situation in the future? So you know, like if I if I say, you know, I realize when I'm carrying my credit card, I'm really a lot more likely to waste money. Maybe I want to use cash to buy stuff, and maybe I want to be a little more careful when I've got this shiny poker chip in my pocket, you know, that I can, uh, because, I'm, because I know that I'm likely to, to spend money in a different way. Maybe, or, you know, I realize I just went to this NBA game and I spent more money than I wanted to. Is there, a, is there another way I can watch some basketball that's just more economical for me? You know, maybe there's a college team or a high school team I can go see and find entertainment that I really like that's just more economical. Uh, and, the way I like to sometimes put that is your high calorie food should t at least taste great. Yeah. So yeah, maybe if I say, hey, I really want to go to that NBA game. Okay, what am I going to do so that that's feasible? So maybe I'm not going out to dinner as much and I'm going to have a little fund that I'm going to call my, my bulls fund. And, and, and every time I don't go out to dinner, I sort of figure out how much money I've saved and I kind of put that towards the bulls fund. And then when it hits $300 or whatever it's going to cost me to go to that bulls game, I say, oh, now I can reward myself with with that Bulls game because I've made it possible for me to do that. So those are the kinds of things that I get excited about. Uh, so that, uh, so you're not on a starvation diet, but you're, f but you're focusing your money on what you really want to spend it on. Yeah, that starvation diet doesn't work. My, my grandfather mm -hmm. had a donkey on the farm and uh, 
times were tough because they didn't have a lot of money to feed mm -hmm. the donkey, and so he decided to train his donkey to survive without food. And he cut his rations in half. The next week, he cut them in half again. <laughs> and just about the time that they trained the donkey to live without food, he died. Yeah. Same thing happens when people, you, you got to allow yourself some cheat days. you got to allow yourself some caloric intakes, yeah. but we got to be responsible about it. So one final mm -hmm. comment before yeah. we start sharing mm -hmm. budgeting yeah. tips. Our smart goal example yeah. touched on credit card debt. Yeah. So uh, talk about why it's so important to pay off your credit card every month and to avoid credit card debt. Oh, credit card, credit card debt is, is really the most toxic thing that most of us experience financially. It, when you are running a balance on your credit card, you're paying an interest rate that's usually 16, 20%. There's no investment that you can make, unless you're like Warren Buffett, there's no investment you're gonna make that comes anywhere near what you're gonna get from paying down your credit card. And there's so much about the way the credit card works that is cued so that you keep a balance. Like they give you this thing, the minimum payment. There's nothing about that minimum payment that is valuable for you. I mean, obviously you should pay, you know, if you don't pay the minimum payment, you get a penalty, but they're trying to encourage you to believe that the minimum payment is somehow valuable for you to do. You really, you really wanna pay your credit card off in full every month, and if you can't pay it off in full every month, that's often a moment for self-awareness where you sort of say, how much am I spending on my credit card? Am I going to Starbucks every day in a way that at the end of the month creates a problem for me to pay it off? I, maybe that's something I gotta change. And ignore your credit card reward program, by the way. Yeah. That is something, we, there's a lot of evidence that what the credit card reward program does is it encourages you to spend more money. And so I, I you absolutely wanna do everything you can to pay off that credit card uh, as quickly as you can. Yeah. Uh, and I think they've changed. I've gotten to the point where I don't pay attention to the minimum uh, mm -hmm. payment, but I started getting emails saying that you recently made an, a large purchase. You can spread that out over several months if, if yeah. it helps. And it almost seems like this makes smart financial sense. Whenever does someone... That make, does that make sense to spread it out over several months? Whenever anyone sells you anything and says, I'm going to help you pay for it by spreading out the payments or anything about your cash flow, what they're doing is they're actually giving you implicitly or explicitly a high interest rate loan. Yeah. That is a red flag when they're basically telling you, you can, you can stretch this out. And wow, you're gonna pay a high interest rate for that when you stretch that out. Now sometimes it does make sense if you, get a, if you have a high credit card debt, sometimes you can get a new credit card at a lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. There are times when uh, you wanna pay attention if there's opportunities there but when someone's telling you, it's like when you walk in the car dealer and they start telling you about how you can finance the car, what they're basically doing is they're trying to suck you in so that, you're, so that you lose your leverage about the price. And so whenever someone's helping you with your cash flow, that's always a red flag. Great. So now that you've identified financial priorities and written goals, it's time mm -hmm. to dig into budgeting tips that will help you reach those goals. We all know that we should set a budget, but mm -hmm. it's not always so easy. So let's break it down. The first step to creating a successful budget is to assess your current situation. Mm -hmm. Much like goal setting, you want to create a realistic budget that you can stick to. It's nice to put a, a budget on paper, but if you can't actually execute it, it doesn't do you much good. So start by reviewing your income. You may have fixed income like a salary if you're in the workforce or income from a variety of sources if you're retirement age. You'll also want to look at your variable income, like tips, overtime, and bonuses. Some of you may only have variable income if your jobs are hourly or largely dependent on tips. If that's the case, it's helpful to average your income from three months. Also, keeping in mind any seasonal spikes that might inflate your average. Next, you'll want to review all your expenses. Fixed expenses are typically easier to identify because they remain constant from month to month. These might be things like your rent or mortgage, utilities, childcare, or loans. You can see other examples on the screen. The next step may take a bit longer, but it will be helpful to review your spending and identify opportunities to save. Look at your variable expenses like groceries and household items, gas or transportation, dining out and entertainment, and all the other things you purchase. Review three months of spending, noting any seasonal expenses like birthdays or holiday gifts. Uh, also, your gas bills or power bills may go up more with air conditioning or heating and cooling or heating. 
So when you look at your total income and your total expenses, are you in balance? Are you spending more than you are earning? And if so, do you know what you are overspending on? Maybe you have extra income left over, which is great. But what are you doing with that extra money? Are you using it to save for your goals? Now that you have a better understanding of your personal situation, it's time to look at some popular budgeting styles for inspiration. There is no right or wrong way to budget or a magic bullet that works for everyone. It's important to focus on, work, what works, <laughs> focus on what works best for you, which you may not know until you try. So you may want to try a few different budget uh, techniques going forward. The first budgeting style we'll look at is the traditional budgeting method, sometimes called zero-based. With this style, net income minus expenses should equal zero. Note that savings are considered an expense with this style. Make sure you pay yourself first. Look at the entire year to determine if your net income and expenses balance out. You'll do this by tracking all income and expenses for the year, traditionally in an old school check register. By the end of the year, review your budget and make adjustments for the next year based on actual spending. While this is a very traditional form of budgeting when followed in its original format, you could take the concept and modernize it to fit your needs. You could track your spending digitally with a free budgeting app. You could also balance your budget to zero every month or every pay period. Whatever works best for you in your situation. Next up is the 50-30-20 method that Harold mentioned. This method recommends splitting your net income into three large buckets. Your needs, your wants, and your savings. With 50% of your income going to your needs and obligations like housing, groceries, utilities, etc. The next 30% can go towards your non-essential ones like dining out, entertainment, your hobbies, clothes. This bucket also includes any upgrade decisions like a luxury vehicle instead of a more modest vehicle. And that last 20% of your paycheck should go towards savings. This method lumps different types of savings into one bucket so this would include your emergency savings fund, your retirement savings, and other short and long-term savings, maybe like college savings for your kid. You may ask, what if my buckets don't split up this way? If you're close and still hitting your savings amount, you're probably fine. But if they are way off, you may consider adjusting your lifestyle to allow for more balance and more savings. The last budgeting style we'll look at today is the envelope method. This style focuses on how you track your spending. To get started, think about expense categories. You can consolidate or keep things as separate as you want. Next, you'll decide on a budget amount for each category. After you have your categories and budget, write each category on the outside of an envelope. One envelope per category. Then add the cash amount that you budgeted to each envelope. Throughout the month or your pay period, whatever time frame you've chosen, you'll only use the cash in the envelopes to pay for things. The idea is that you feel the transaction more and when you hand over cash versus swiping a card or tapping your phone. Another key element of this style is that you don't borrow from other envelopes. When money from one category is gone, you are done spending in that category until the end of the month or the pay period. This is a way to hold you accountable and keep you tuned in to your spending habits. As we've mentioned before, you can adapt this method to better fit your needs. You could digitally track your spending on an app or in notes on your phone instead of using cash. You could also use this method just for your variable expenses or your fund money. It's important to keep in mind that the best budgeting method is the one that you can stick to. The Fitwell Hub has a budgeting tool to help you get started and it includes a section for savings goals. You can check it out at the link provided in the chat. So Harold, are there any budgeting methods or tips that have helped you? I think there's a couple, by the way, when you said pay yourself first. I think that's so important to make it automatic. You know, once, when there's money that's in your hot little fingers, it's a lot easier to spend it. So one of the things that I think is really valuable is 
have some automatic thing that's taken out of your paycheck, particularly if you can you know, put it into your savings if your employer, you know, if you have a 401k that your employer has a match or something like that. But even if, even if you can't get access to that, just something so that it's, it's put away out of your immediate hands, you've paid yourself. And uh, I think that's really important. The, uh, as I mentioned, I think it's really important to think about uh, you know, your high calorie food should taste great. You know, if you're spending a lot of money on something, is that really uh, what you want? And to be comparison shopping about your big ticket items and the recurring expenses. So, you know, if, if, like your cable TV and your phone. One of my problems is I'm lazy about comparison shopping. I'll be in a phone plan that I've been put in by my phone provider, and I like never check. And very often there's just something cheaper. Like I've got unlimited minutes, but I don't use very many minutes because I don't like to talk on the phone. And then, well, you're, you're not alone. And, and uh, you know, if I have, if, am I in a cable TV plan, you know, is there some cheaper cable TV thing? Or when I buy a car, have I tried out like Consumer Reports or Costco or various ways I could buy my car that, uh, that might be more economical? Or am I walking into the dealer and seeing a car and all of a sudden become really excited about it and then I end up overpaying for that? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm about to buy a house, am I thinking about what do I really value in a house? Am I, uh, am I, am I only paying for the thing that I really, the things that I really want? I, and uh, I think those are the kinds of things that are very helpful. Uh, and, uh, and 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 I think it can all help each other too. You know, one of the things sometimes we encourage each other to spend more money than we should. You know, if I, if we're all going out to dinner, can we can we pick a place that's reasonably priced? You know, things like that. Yeah, and I think you find lots of so-called mm -hmm. financial experts telling you what you should spend on or how much you can spend. Uh, you mentioned figuring out a house, what you need in a house, but a lot of people start by going to see to get a mortgage and see what they can afford. Yeah. And frequently, the bank will tell you how much you can afford, and that amount may be more than you actually need to spend on a house. Yeah, but it's very tempting <laughs> if people say, well, well I, guess I'm not, I guess I'm not getting enough house. I can afford more. That's such a great point because what, they're at, what they actually mean by what you can afford is the absolute maximum you can spend on that house. And you know, when you think about that, why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I, I could buy a hundred thousand dollar car. I could probably afford that. Uh, you know, what does that do for me? <laughs> you know, I mean, compared to, I, you know, I just want to be able to get to the store. You know, with my car. Yeah, so. I think people are. Uh, you're right. Motivated when you got money in your hands, it's a real. Uh, desire to spend that because they're things we want. And that's why we find the, uh, the basis of our Secure Choice Retirement Savings Program mm -hmm. is take money for your, pay yourself first. Take it out and put it into your own individual Roth IRA. If you don't see it, if you don't touch it, you generally don't miss it. I'm so glad you mentioned the Roth. I think the Roth is such a great thing for so many people because it, 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 it's something where there's some tax advantage. You know, you will not pay taxes on the investment gain that you get from the Roth, which is really valuable. It's also an emergency reserve because the amount that you put, in, what you contribute, you can actually take out without penalty. So if you have some sort of an emergency, the Roth is, can be helpful for that as part of your strategic reserve. By the way, people often ask me, like, what should I invest in, mm -hmm. in my Roth? And that's actually the easy part. You basically want to do these low index Low, low fee index funds, like if you say, I'm going to retire at age 65, a target, a target date fund that sets your 65th birthday through any of the major providers, that basically is pretty sensible. You want to stay away from stuff like crypto, any shiny, anything, any shiny object, or anybody who claims that they're going to tell you what's going to happen to the stock market in the next year. Stay away from all that. All the data are, those, those things are usually terrible. Uh, uh, so a financial advisor can sometimes be helpful. By the way, they should have the word advisor. That yes. actually comes with legal obligations that are called fiduciary obligations that they have to give you advice that is your own, that is, they're telling you the thing that is best for you financially. And, and if they don't have that legal obligation, they can, then you're talking to a salesman. So. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, all this seems very simple here. Mm -hmm. um, Warren Buffett, one of our country's richest men though, um, uh, outlines his plan for becoming rich. And, it's, well, he's, uh, he's in, uh, he explains it, and people say, well, why don't more people follow that? 
Remember what he said? There. Because no, because no one wants to um, uh, get rich slowly. Yes. Everyone wants to get rich quickly. I think that is so true. I mean, who and who among us? But what's interesting is Warren Buffett when he when he's leaving his money to his own children, he basically said, "Don't try to be me. Invest in a low fee. Invest in low fee index funds, and don't mess with it." Because, he, because he's like, you know, I am Warren Buffett. I, I can actually, and, and I'm the person you'd be competing against if you were trying to pick, you know, what stocks to buy. You know, I, you know if I say, I, you know, I think Toyota's going to do really well next year. There's somebody at Goldman Sachs whose full-time job is to figure that out. That's the person that I'm competing against. And of course, she's going to be better at that than I'm going to be because I have a different job. And... Uh, uh, and that get, risk, that get rich slowly strategy is the key. So we find with Secure Choice that mm -hmm. the automated uh, payroll deduction mm -hmm. going right into their account is, is helpful. Mm -hmm. If someone's not part of Secure Choice, how valuable is automated savings and what options do people have to do that? Oh, there's a, it's so valuable. And there's lots of ways you can do that. You could do it through Secure Choice. You can do it through your, very often you can do it through your employer. You can do it through Fidelity or Vanguard or other vendors like that. And, and I, I just think it is critical to find a way to do that. And, and if you have trouble doing that, you know, that's where talking to a financial advisor uh, you know, can be helpful because they can set you up with that. And, uh, and, and certainly I, I'm so grateful that I did that. And, uh, uh, you know, and it, there, there's lots of, lots of viable options. Yeah, what I, what I found I tell people is uh, one of these strongest forces in the universe is inertia. <laughs> yes. That a body at rest tends to stay in rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion. And what we try to do with Secure Choice is set that body in motion. Because mm -hmm. I find that everyone knows they need to save for retirement. I mean, we, we try and educate people here. Everyone knows they need to. Yeah. The question is, how do you make it a habit? How do you overcome some of those obstacles? And, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of ways out there. We've got some great ones on, uh, on our website. Any other last uh, advice before we switch over to audience uh, questions? Yeah, I think you, you want to set up your life so that the smart thing is the easy thing and the thing that you're doing. So the great thing about making it automatic is I don't have to think about it. It's just happening in a sensible way all the time. And I mean, no one's going to be perfect, but that's going to move you closer to, to be sensible. And, uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and know your vulnerabilities and pay attention to that. You know, if you're, uh, and if you're fascinated by, like one, I'll just mention one vulnerability and then I'll stop talking, which is if you're fascinated by the stock market, that is a vulnerability. That's kind of like I'm fascinated by the, the way the machines work in the casino. Uh, do not think that you're saving for your retirement if you're really actively trading in the stock market. That is a, that is a different thing. A and so, so stay grounded and sensible and boring. That yeah. Yeah, it's great advice. I think, you know, the University of Chicago, which is known for having all of these uh, Nobel laureates in economics, uh, sometimes this seems fairly simple. You have a colleague, Richard Thaler, who uh, wrote a book just called Nudge, yes. I think. Sometimes you just need a little nudge to start going in the right direction, and that's that providing that inertia uh, to keep going. 100%. So the audience has asked some questions. Uh, our first question is, how do I start achieving goals as a single mother with a six-year-old child. I know with children, they are expensive. There are a lot of costs out there, and if you're a single mother doing this, um, how do you find some extra money for savings? I think that there's, there's a lot of layers to this question, and a lot depends on what your personal situation is. The first thing is I would look at my debt. Very often, if you're in that situation, you may have some debt that you have to manage. There are also, if you, you, you may also want to get some expert advice. Your local United Way actually is often a, 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 a good source to turn to for some advice. Uh, and, and I think all the budgeting tools that we just talked about are really valuable. Uh, and by the way, I commend you, the single mom, I was raised by a single mom, and, and uh, the single moms rock it. One of the great things about single moms is they're much better investors than, than, uh, than single men. It turns out single men are the worst investors and are also the most self-confident. And one of the things that's great about, about moms like yourself is they're asking the question. And, uh, uh, and I, think th I think some of the questions about how do I manage, how do I, how do I earn the most money is also an important question. But uh, 
I'll, I'll leave it there. I don't know if you want to add to that. Right. Well, let's go on another question here. Um, we talked earlier mm -hmm. about saving for yourself, and that can be mm -hmm. retirement savings, mm -hmm. it can be an emergency saving mm -hmm. fund. And one sort of saving mm -hmm. fund people talk about is, how should I think about a rainy day fund? You know, and what constitutes a rainy day? How much should I be saving there? And is it a certain amount every month, or is it until you get to a certain amount and then your, your fund is okay? I think that you need at least three, four months expenses as a strategic reserve. It's hard to do, but I think that's what you want to do. There's a couple advantages to that. One is you're ready if you have a rainy day. The other is it's so much easier to be strategic when you have that strategic reserve. One of the things that I found was that when I was, when I really had no rainy day fund and I was worried, am I going to run out of money at the end of the month, I was, it was hard for me to make long-term decisions because I was just always nervous about the end of the month. And once you have that rainy day fund, it's so much easier to be strategic. There, and so making automatic, uh, you know, every month I want to have, I want to have a, you know, couple hundred dollars that's just going into my rainy day fund that I just never touch. And one of the nice things about the current interest rate environment is that you can, uh, you know, th th there are ways you can save that, that generate a reasonable interest rate without taking any real risks in the stock market, uh, you know, that are pretty sensible. And, uh, uh, you know, there's I bonds, there's CDs that pay reasonable rates, and so there's lots of things you can put your rainy day fund in uh, that um, you know that would that would at least generate some return, and it's not like cash in your mattress. Yeah, it's uh, some it sounds easy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, difficult mm -hmm. for a lot of people, especially people with lower mm -hmm. income. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you said it's sort of set goals and figure your mojo. Mm -hmm. It really pays benefits in terms of mental health as well. We had a, a press conference talking about a retirement savings program. And there was a young man who came and he said, I've always been in the red. He said, but on the way here to this press conference, I mm -hmm. was thinking about all the bills I had to pay. He said, but then I thought, I have money sitting aside in my, for, in my Roth IRA. Yeah. He said, I actually have more money sitting in that account than I have bills. He said, for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm in the black. I'm worth something. I have a net worth. And that's nice, but he also just said, like, I, uh, I feel better about myself. And we've talked to employers who say that happy mm -hmm. employees, employees that don't have mm -hmm. that stress you talked about, those worries, work better. And so really, it is, it is really important for your own mental health, for your productivity, to spend some time on budgeting and to work towards to get yourself in the black. Don't be discouraged. If you find yourself drowning mm -hmm. in credit card debt, you're probably not going to solve that tomorrow. You're not going to mm -hmm. solve it next month. But make sure you have a plan to get there eventually. And Figure I think what it, those steps are. And I think it, and that gives you an immediate reward. Like I'm walking past the Starbucks and I really want to get that $5 mocha latte, blah, 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 whatever. And how do I motivate myself not to waste that $5 today? Well, you know, I'm going to be so much... I'll be so much less stressed at the end of this month if I have like the 12 times that I didn't buy that Starbucks, I now have $60 that I can put into my rainy day fund. Uh, you know, that is going to reduce my stress. And, that, and, uh, uh, and that's a real thing. Yeah. One of our audience mem members asked a question that I think probably a lot of people think mm -hmm. about. Um, we talk about tracking mm -hmm. your bills mm -hmm. on a basic spreadsheet, but mm -hmm. um, not everyone may have a, a laptop at home with a spreadsheet. And, and some people may not be comfortable working in such, with such tools. So what tools are available for tracking your bills besides a basic spreadsheet? So I think the Finwell app, by the way, is a good place to look for some of those tools. Uh, there's, there are things like Mint. You know, there are apps that you can get on your phone. That, that, uh, there's a number of apps that are now being, being offered uh, that, that allow you to keep track and, uh, and uh, uh, be uh, so I, I think that that you don't have to have an Excel spreadsheet and, ent and enter everything the way we used to. Although I think there's some value in that, by mm -hmm. the way. Even if it's just writing it in, in a notebook, and it's not, a, it just, it just. When I start writing down my expenses, I start noticing stuff that I just wasn't noticing before. Like, oh yeah, I'm spending more money than I thought I was spending going to the vending machine or whatever it is that I'm doing or uh, taking cabs coming, you know, taking Uber and Lyft coming home from the whatever. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're, even if it's not part of any electronic thing, if you're just taking notice of it, that can really help. Yeah. 
I find that saving, you know, we say you should uh, invest in yourself mm -hmm. first, you should pay yourself mm -hmm. first and focus mm -hmm. on your retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a lot of parents, mm -hmm. you, know, you feel great generosity and responsibility towards your children. You know that uh, education mm -hmm. is very important to them. And so mm -hmm. you think about, well, maybe I need to be saving for, for college first. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our viewers asked, do you have any suggestions for families on how to target how much to save for college? I mean, on the one mm -hmm. hand, you know, we, every little bit counts. On the other hand, it just seems like with cost today, it's a mm -hmm. mountain that some people can't climb. Yeah. Uh, so how do you go about setting that goal for a college education for your child? That's a, I think that's an individual question. That's, I can't give a, a uniform answer for everybody. There are things called 529 accounts that Illinois and other states run, which are valuable. I think one of the nice things about the Roth IRA, though, is that if you say, I don't know that I have enough money to save both for my retirement and my kid's college, I'll put some money in the 529, but then I'll put a bunch into the Roth IRA, and, it, and if I need it for my kid's college, I can withdraw the parts that I'm putting in without penalty. Uh, although it's nice if you can avoid doing that, but if you need to do that, you can do that. Uh, and, uh, and I think whatever, and that's also whatever method works for you. Uh, I think that if you, if a lot of parents are like, I just need to save for my kid's college so that I can feel I'm being a good parent. So I don't really want to do that Roth IRA thing you just said. I want to put it all into a 529 account. You know, that's great. And there's other parents who say, well, I, I want to put into the 529, but I also need that strategic reserve. So I'm going to mix it up and do the Roth too. That's great too. Whatever method works for you. And also, you know, you're not going to be perfect and college is expensive. Uh, so, you know, none of us are like, I've, uh, you know, I, I've got all of this taken care of without any stress. So I think giving yourself, you need some self-compassion that we're all going to do the best we can. But those are, those are some things that I think about. Yeah. Well, we've talked an awful lot about how individuals can save and talked about mm -hmm. saving for mm -hmm. parents with young children, those single mothers. Uh, but some of us are in families. And uh, I can create a budget, but there are other people in my household who spend money as well. Um, how do I focus on budgeting and spending less? Uh, but how do I, I, I know I can do it, but how do I get my spouse and kids on the same page? Is a question that I know a, a lot of people out there have. Wow. By the way, one of the interesting things is when, I'm, when I talk to my students, it turns out money is the most sensitive relationship topic. There's a ton of people who are like, I totally know what you did last summer. We share each other's Facebook passwords. You know, I know about all your previous girlfriends from college, whatever, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know how to tell my partner that I've got $5,000 worth of credit card debt. And that's sensitive. And I, think, and I think talking with your spouse about money and about the different ways that you, the different styles that you have is really important because, because many of us do not do that. And, uh, and I think getting on the same page as your partner about money is just so critical for the long run success of that relationship and also for your ability to save. And I think you have to, there's give and take because, you know, the question, because part of it is how do I get my spouse on the same page with me? And part of it is how does my spouse get me on the same page with them? Because, yeah. because you know, we all have, uh, you know, so for, like I'm really into cameras and I, and I, Talk to my wife, like how much is real, what's reasonable for me to spend on a camera so that my spouse doesn't feel like I'm wasting a ton of our money on that. Uh, and, and, you know, she has things that she likes, and so we talk about that. I think with kids, it, I think it is important to give kids a sense of, uh, of money and to understand the bank of mom and dad is not a permanent source of resources. So I think having kids on an allowance and to say you're responsible for, uh, there's certain things that we pay for for you. You know, you're 10 years old. We really don't expect you to be contributing towards gas for the car. But uh, you know, if you wanna, uh, if you have certain hobbies, you know, you kind of have to. Here's your allowance, and 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 start budgeting that. And we're gonna show you how we budget a little bit. Uh, we're gonna give you a little bit on the birds and the bees of budgeting, uh, so that so that you can start and, and be methodical about it. And I do think it's important. Uh, that we that we get our kids on the same page and uh, and, and educate our kids and uh, and talk to them about how we save for our retirement, how we don't do crypto and <laughs> we don't do stuff that's that's ill-advised that they're getting from the environment. 
uh, it's a little bit like sex. You know, they're getting a ton of stuff from the environment, whatever you do as a parent. And so you want to make sure you're providing the positive messages that go with it. If you're like, I'm, I'm not going to talk about money with my kids until they're 17 years old, they're going to get all kinds of messages from the environment uh, about conspicuous consumption. You know, I got to have the nicest clothes. I got to have, you know, uh, the way I'm popular is by spending a lot of money, whatever. You, you want to you talk to them about, about that stuff, you know, early. I think it's important that you set boundaries for them. Mm -hmm. that they have to live within a budget, but you also give them some agency here. If you just mm -hmm. tell them, no, 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 you can't spend that, there's a rejection. And I think it's the same with a spouse. I think some of the people mm -hmm. had questions about how do I get my spouse on the same page. How do you get the both of you to be on the <laughs> same page? Because when you say, here is your budget that you have to live within, there's a lot of resentment to being told. And I feel like uh, yeah. people, I think one of the problems with talking about money is there's a feeling of control. But if you can mm -hmm. sit down and collectively agree what the budget is, I think then it becomes easier to stay in line with the budget. But I think as men, I think we have to, this is a moment of humility for us as men because a lot of the evidence is that, is that women are better at this than men. Women feel a sense of, very often women feel a sense of caretaking responsibility for the family and also are more humble about, uh, about, their, about their knowledge about saving and investing. And, and uh, so I think one of the things that we should do as men is to make sure that we are listening to our partners and, on the, and, and learning from them about uh, how, how, you know, if, if I know that my partner's thinking about our kids every day and thinking and worrying about that, how can I, that, that's a strength. I want to draw from that. And, you know, so I, I really want to buy this camera, but I know my wife is thinking about my kid's college. Mm -hmm. That's great. She's reminding me, you know, of that long-term goal. And, and uh, so I think we can all learn from each other's strengths in that way. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, people have, and my guess is there's a different answer here, mm -hmm. uh, or different answers. Mm -hmm. What is a good percentage of my salary to save for retirement? Uh, different numbers are thrown out there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we have numbers for a secure choice. We get passed in legislation. People say 10%, 15%. We see the 15, 30, 50, 30, 20. What do you think? And I assume it depends on someone's circumstances. I think the ideal goal is 20%. Uh, I think that it is, I think if you're at, if you're at a low income point, I think 15 may be more realistic for some people. And I think, I think I would include, by the way, in your savings, drawing down your debt. So, you know, if, if you're like, I don't make a lot of money and I've got a lot of debt, I think you want to say I'm saving 20% of my money, but I'm going to give myself credit for paying down that credit card and stuff like that. Because paying down your credit card is actually way, that's the highest return investment you're going to make. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I would count that towards, towards that. But I think 20% of your pre-tax income is kind of what, is the aspirational goal that we should that we should aim at, and I think that if you're, if you know, if you're young and you don't have kids yet, uh, you can. I think that's that, that is achievable for a lot of people. I think at different points in the life cycle that can be har easier or harder, but that's what I say. Great. Uh, another viewer asked, any advice for someone whose monthly expenses change month to month? And we talked about averaging, but you know, some people mm -hmm. uh, might be laid off during the winter and work longer hours in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, any general advice for those people whose expenses change month to month? I think your idea of averaging over, over months and say 20% of the average is what I'm aiming for. And, and being self-aware that when I get that windfall, I w it's tempting to reward myself for that windfall and not think about the fact, well, two months from now I'm going to have a shortfall. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a waiter and I'm making a lot of money during the Christmas season, but in February, my income's going to go down. You know, I, I got to make sure that I'm planning ahead for that and that averaging that you described is a good way to, to do that. And I think that's where making the savings automatic is also very helpful because when you make your savings automatic, then what's happening is the months that you're getting a lot of income, if you say, I'm automatically going to save 20% of my income, when I get a big windfall, I'm saving more. The 20% is a bigger number. Yeah. Unless that windfall becomes automatic going forward, my advice to people is, take that extra money and put that towards savings. If you were surviving the previous month on X number of dollars, you should be able to survive the next month on X and take that Y and put it aside for a rainy day. You know, by the way, when you get a raise, that's a great yes. moment for what you're saying. If you're already living a certain lifestyle and then you get a raise at your job, see if you can save 
put that put that raise into your savings because you're already, you know, I, I know how to live on this salary, and now I've got a five percent raise. Why don't I put my five percent into my savings if I can, or most of that five percent, and uh, and keep living the way I was living before? I, and it's a great time to explore automatic savings or so, mm -hmm. because you said if if you allow that money to come into your hot little hands, <laughs> there's a great incentive, there's a great desire to spend that money if it can automatically go out into a retirement, a Roth IRA, or four hundred one k, or whatever vehicle you have. Um, you can continue living as you were. Uh, another question, uh, Dr. Pollock mentioned paying off the entire credit card balance each month. What are his thoughts on paying off the statement balance each month instead? This was also a result in zero interest. Some sources seem to indicate that this is a better way to increase your credit score. The, I think as long as you are paying zero interest, whatever way works for you is good. Uh, I think I think that I mean they, they, those methods will, will kind of average out to be the same. So uh, if, if paying the statement balance uh, is the way that that you get the most mojo, then you should do it. But I, I think you just want to make sure that you do not have a running balance from month to month uh, that you're that you're paying interest on, and also and also that you try to have the balance is not so large. You know, we talk about a rainy day fund. The mm -hmm. inverse of the rainy day fund mm -hmm. is I've got a big credit card bill because that means that if it starts to rain, I now have this huge obligation that it becomes a bigger burden. So when you, when you keep that credit card bill low, it's also protecting you against some sort of bad event that might happen. Like say my income goes down, I don't, ha I don't, I don't have this overhang of that credit card debt. But I think it, that question, you're already so close to doing the right thing. Anyway, either you pay off the full statement balance or you pay off whatever you owe on that day. You're doing great. Yeah. Well, I think uh, those are all our questions from viewers right now. I want to thank everyone for tuning in here today. I want to thank Harold Pollack for joining me today at my first Fireside Finwell chat. Although, you know, uh, it's warming up here. We don't have the actual fire. We have the fireplace. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's the time we have today for questions. I encourage you to use the Finwell Hub as an ongoing resource. So save the date for upcoming programs. On Thursday, May 11th, we'll discuss the key elements to build retirement security. And on Thursday, June 8th, we'll be joined by the Social Security Administration as we demystify Social Security. Registration links, as always, are in the chat. But before you leave, please take a moment Take a minute to complete a short survey to provide feedback about today's webinar and suggest topics for future programs. Survey link, once again, is in the chat. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I want to thank Dr. Harold Pollack for speaking with us and sharing his experiences. It really has been a fun day. We hope you heard some useful tips today and will join us at our next uh, fireside chat. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and great savings.